Hi there, good evening everybody. I can see our numbers rocketing. We've had a record number of registrations for this evening's webinar. So I'm very, very excited to see how many people we're gonna get live. So this is really good. We will start in a couple of minutes. I can see those numbers still going up really quickly. So we will just hang on for a minute or two before we make a start. Good evening to everyone who's just joined us. Thank you for being here. We're just gonna wait a minute or two before we start Jane's delivery of the webinar. Our attendee numbers are still going up pretty quick. Just so, so I get really nervous, basically. I've just got to hold here and then just go. <laughs> <laughs> We're keeping you waiting. Yeah. Looks like the numbers are slowing down just a little bit. We will just hang on. Good evening to those of you who just joined. We will be starting very shortly, just giving people the chance to get in and get settled. Hi there to everyone who's just joined. We'll be starting very shortly. Looks like the numbers are slowing down a little bit. I've had a question come in on the Q&A from Magdalena. Magdalena, I believe you've put your question in um, Polish. I think this is Polish. Um, unfortunately, I only speak English. So if you could repost your question in English, that would be a massive help to me. I'm sorry. I don't speak any other languages. I feel dreadful. <laughs> okay, we've got a really good number of participants now. I can see the numbers are still going up, but they are slowing down. So I think we will um, make a start. So uh, good evening, everybody. And thank you ever so much for being here. Um, this webinar has proved to be our most popular, popular yet. We've had record numbers of people registering to attend and we've definitely got record numbers of people live online with us. So thank you very much for being with us. For those of you who haven't met me before, my name's Rachel Beecham. I'm the training manager for veterinary instrumentation and it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Jane Ladlow. Jane has 20 years experience as a European specialist in small animal surgery. And over the last 15 years, she's been focusing on upper airway disease in dogs. Her BOAS research began in 2005, and in conjunction with colleagues at the University of Cambridge, she devised a non-invasive method of assessing airway function in the bulldog, the French bulldog, and the pug. And she also introduced a clinical grading system for BOAS. She's developed good relationships with breeders, and she's worked with the breed clubs to introduce health schemes in those three breeds that included BOAS. Her research has also led to the validation of new surgical techniques such as laser turbinectomy and laryngeal surgeries. And the project led to the development of the Kennel Club and University of Cambridge Respiratory Function Grading Scheme, the RFG, which was launched in 2019 to facilitate the breeding of healthy dogs in those three breeds, bulldogs. French Bulldogs and Pugs. And Jane's continuing this work by promoting the RFG scheme. And she now intends to start looking at some of the other brachycephalic breeds in addition to doing routine clinical work. So before starting tonight's presentation, I'd just like to highlight a few points for this evening. There will be some interactive polls during this evening's webinar. That's to encourage interaction and to help us understand our audience a little better. So do please join in with those on screen if you're able to. Uh, questions from our audience are definitely very, very welcome, definitely encouraged. The Q&A function is open. In fact, I can see we've got some already, so I'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, so post your questions in the Q&A as we go along. And at the end of the webinar, I'll pose those questions to Jane. The webinar is being recorded and the recording link will be sent out via email either tomorrow 
um, or early next week. And for all those of you who are here live, I will also be sending you a CPD attendance certificate. So tonight's webinar topic, as we know, is an introduction to BOAS, diagnosis and surgical techniques. I've had a sneak preview of tonight's presentation and I can promise you it's going to be good. Um, I also know that Jane has a great deal of material to cover for us tonight. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Jane. Jane, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Rachel. And um, thank you very much to all the delegates who are spending their evening um, listening to this webinar. Much appreciated. Um, it's an interesting topic, um, but maybe I'm a little bit of a, an obsessive about this, but um, I'm going to share what, what I've come across. And um, I don't know all the answers, but I do know quite a lot about some of these dogs. OK, um, so um, let's just start a little bit with how this um, project started. Uh, this is my first little slip. Sorry, guys. Um, this is really a 20 year project now, and um, it all started with a bulldog that I operated on and he didn't do quite as well as I expected. So I decided that I would have a little look at this as a quick and fast research project, and I would work out how um, to measure breathing function in some of these dogs. And it took me about 10 years to get that bit sorted. Um, a lot of the work was done with a very close colleague of mine, Nai Che Lu, who has now gone back to Taiwan. I managed to keep her in the UK for 11 years, uh, but she's now um, a, a assistant professor in the Taipei University. Um, so. We'll talk a little bit about what we learned in this journey, the pathophysiology, um, how we recognize BOAS and some of the measurements we are now using so that we can all talk about BOAS in the same language. Um, what I would typically use for diagnosis and then a few of my tips for surgery. Now, when I started the project, which was in 2003, um, I was mainly looking at bulldogs because we didn't see many French bulldogs. and. The reason this project has become quite um, prominent is because the French bulldog numbers have exploded worldwide. And um, in the UK, they've gone up exponentially. So it's, it's one of our top breeds now. It usually comes in as the first or second most commonly registered in the Kennel Club statistics. And that, that has unfortunately gone across the world. So, and it doesn't seem to matter what we say on social media. Um, the the um, inclination for people to go and replace French bulldogs with another French bulldog is immense. So we're not really getting the message over there that are a healthier breed. So I think we have to look at the breeds we have and how we can improve them. So first little question is, is how are you feeling about the diagnosis and management of BOAS cases? And I'm sure I've got some of you guys in the audience that know exactly what we're doing with BOAS. And um, maybe a few that are looking for some tips and then maybe some that are a little bit nervous about this. So, OK, good. So that polls on screen for you now. I can see people joining in already, which is great. It's quite funny. There's a few that I think could probably give this lecture themselves. OK, <laughs> it's good. Oh, this is great participation already. 65, Thank you, guys. 65%. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for joining in. We'll just leave that on screen for another 10 or 15 seconds, let people put their answers in. Yeah, um, I feel very happy that many of you guys feel relatively confident about this because this is a topic that we do talk about a lot now. And I think we are talking about recognition a lot more. So this is making me feel very good. Um, very confident, most of the time I'm in that bracket, but sometimes I, I do get a bit nervous because there are still some very difficult cases. So that's the other thing I want to really show you guys this evening, which are the cases to be careful about, because there are some cases that I'm kind of, I've got my adrenals going when I see them. So, so yeah, I think, I think I'm somewhere between this lot. So I'm just sharing the results on screen now so that our audience can see how everybody else voted. <laughs> So that was 72% of our audience answered that question and 58% of those that answered are relatively confident but looking for more tips. Jane, I think that's great. So I'm going to stop sharing that on the screen now. And we'll move over, yeah. So um, there's a couple of things that I always start by saying. So the first thing is brachycephalic is short head. Okay, so there is um, a lot of information about there about the, the length of the nose and 
Um, some people get totally fixated on the length of the nose, and I don't because a lot of the areas that are troubling for us and are causing the obstruction are actually underneath the base of the skull. And the original defect is in the buzzy sphenoid and the presphenoid bones, and they are right at the base of the skull, and it's the pharyngeal area that is often compressed. So I'm not saying a short nose is great. Um, I don't think it is. But certainly, if we just focus on the nose, we are not going to sort out the problem. OK, so brachycephalic is short head and it's not just short head, it's the wide head. So when we look at some of the new breeds that are coming in that we are seeing affected, like the American bullies, I find these guys really quite scary because they're not even brachycephalic in the traditional sense, short nose, but they are incredibly wide head. So if you measure them, they come up as a brachycephalic dog, but it's that width that's causing us the problem. Um, so it's a really interesting area. And yeah, think about the whole head, the length of the skull. So it varies a little bit between breeds, what we are going to see. So this is a very breed specific condition. And I would quite like to term this French Bulldog, um, obstructive airway syndrome, pug obstructive airway syndrome and Bulldog obstructive airway syndrome. But maybe that's a little bit too complex. Um, but the lesion sites do vary between the breeds. I think the most important lesion site in all of these breeds is the nostril, okay? And that's interesting. We're looking at 13 other brachycephalic breeds at the moment. So we've got Pomeranians on there and Chihuahuas, King Charles Spaniels, Cavaliers, um, Pekingese. And in all of those breeds, um, the nostril stenosis still seems to be the most important conformational factor, which is really interesting. So there's two bits of the nostril. There is the external nostril wing, and then there is also the internal alar fold, which we call the inner nostril or the second stenosis. And in some of our guys, that inner stenosis, that alar fold can actually touch the medium filtrum and really cause significant obstruction. Now we've graded these nostrils, um, for, and it's a little bit breed specific, um, but it's depending on how much gap there is dorsally. And it's that dorsal gap that is so important because the air goes in dorsally and over the alar fold and then flows back to the ventral nasal conca. So we sometimes see these guys that have got moderate stenosis. And I feel sorry for these breeders because they come and show me these dogs and say, look, there's a hole, but the hole's in the wrong spot. OK, so what we're doing with the nostrils is we're concentrating on this dorsal aspect. And the open nostrils have got a clear gap between the medium filtrum and that lateral nasal wing. OK, so a few millimeters gap. And we're seeing more nostrils that are decent in bulldogs and pugs, I have to say, than French bulldogs. But look, this is still a French bulldog, nice nostril. Now, the mild stenosis we define as, as a gap, but a small gap between the filtrum and the lateral cartilage wing. And this is still better than having a moderate stenosis with no gap or a severe stenosis where there is absolutely no gap with the nostril at all. OK, and we do see quite a few of these dogs around. Um, so we have kept this in the grading system, and I do look at nostrils quite carefully because, because we know it's such an important conformational factor. Now, we'll talk about nostril approaches coming up in, in the next bit of the surgical lecture. Um, but I think one thing I will always encourage breeders to do is try and open these nostrils, OK? So, so the nostril is, is probably the thing I focus on most of all when I'm talking to breeders as well. Now, the other thing that I look at with a nostril is the mobility. So this guy has got open nostrils that are mobile. So when the dog pants or gets a little bit excited, we've got lateral movement. And that's typically seen more with our open or mildly stenotic nostrils. This is a guy who's got severely stenotic nostrils. Sorry, let me just flip back. So this guy's got severely stenotic nostrils. Can't find my video there. And he's not got any movement at all with those nostrils. So not only do they have excessive tissue in the way, but they're completely fixed. And that we are typically seeing with nostrils that are moderately or severely stenosed. OK, so you've got a double whammy with a, with a nostril. If it's really stenosed, it also tends not to move. Now, if we move a little bit further back, we're now in the nasal cavity. And we've got the alar fold here again, which we've mentioned. So the alar fold is here. And then the air goes over the top of the alar fold and it goes around the ventral nasal concha and the middle concha and then through into the nasal meatus through the coene. Um, and the olfactory turbinates are, are more dorsal here. So the maxillo olfactory turbinates are there. 
Now, in a mesocephalic or a dolichocephalic dog, these turbinates are thin and they all go back. So once you branch from the alar fold, the ventral nasal conca, all the turbinates go cordially and it's a nice laminar flow. So I always think of this as like a phyllo pastry. And you want thin because you've got a really nice mucous membrane surface there, large surface area, and that's how these dogs cool down um, when they are panting. Now, unfortunately for our guys, we have an issue where we have excessive turbinate. So they come forward. So this is a ventral nasal conca here. And this bit here is a rostral aberrant turbinate. And this shouldn't be there. OK, it should have gone back. So we've got this excessive turbinate tissue, this bit as well. And not only are in the wrong place, so they've curled forward, but they're really thick and they're club like. OK, now you can recognize dogs that have got obstructive nasal cavities because they tend to move to mouth breathing really quickly. So this is a dog that's done a three minute exercise. And he's overheating as well. So you recognize these guys because they, they will mouth breathe as soon as they are stressed. Um, they tend to overheat. And these guys also often are the ones that have the regurgitational and the sleep apnea, okay, the sleep disorder breathing. So you do get used to recognizing when they've got a marked nasal obstruction. Now, we're going a little bit further back now, and we are now at the area of the nasopharynx, so between the pterygoid bones. And this is a dog that I operated on. I did a beautiful job on the palate, and I didn't fix him because of this bit. OK, so this is his nasopharynx. And when the pterygoid bones become quite narrowed, so you get a triangular shape here. Let me play that again. This is a poor prognostic indicator. So that's the back of the nasal cavity coming to that pterygoid region there. And that's really narrow. And these guys for us don't do particularly well. OK, and I can't really take that palate much shorter. Um, but it, yeah, these, these are real trouble for us. Now, we also think this may be reflective of the fact that the bully, particularly in the French Bulldogs, has also moved forward. So you've got two things going on here. You've got a lot of muscles on those pterygoid bones, a lot of soft tissue. And then you've also got these bully, um, tympanic bully, in a little bit further forward than you would want to have. OK, so there's a few things going on at this region. But this is one area that I look at at the CT scan because I can give a pretty good prognosis of how the dogs are going to do after surgery by this area. Now, I've moved a little bit further back now. I'm at the back of the throat, and I'm now thinking about this oversized soft palate. And the reason I say oversized is if you look at the literature, it's not just the length, it's the thickness. And in, in one area, actually, the thickness is more defined than the length because it's easier to measure a palate's thickness than it is the length. Um, so we know that, the, that if you're looking at BOA severity, the hyperplastic palate is actually more easily documented than the length of it. And also remember, most dogs have got long, soft palates, okay? So I think that thickness is super important. Now, when you see these dogs, they tend to have um, pharyngeal sturtus. But they also do a few other things as well. So this often interferes with eating. So these hyperplastic palates, the dogs will gulp and they will choke and they'll drop their food. Most donors don't even realize that's abnormal. So the owners will turn around after surgery and say how much better their dogs are eating. And they haven't really picked up before the surgery that there's an issue. You also get problems with the bulldogs that produce saliva um, in pools when they're exercising. And it's because they can't swallow and breathe at the same time because of these thick palates. OK, so if you look at the palate in this bulldog, it's a big chunk sitting dorsal to the epiglottis. OK, now if we move on. We can see that in motion now. So we've got these hyperplastic tonsils that are extruded. And then here's that palate, which is thickened and elongated and being pulled into the rim of glottis on inspiration. OK. Now, if you look at a, a mesocephalic or dolichocephalic dog, here is the palate. So that palate is still long. OK. So if you look at the, the overlap with the epiglottis, it's still a half a centimetre or a centimetre, but it's sitting ventral to the epiglottis. So in a in a normal, I shouldn't say normal, but in a normal dog, that palate will still overlap the epiglottis, but it sits in a very different position, partly because it's not so thick and also partly because we haven't got the macroglossia. OK, so it's not just the length, it's the thickness and also the position of the palate that's causing our problems. 
And we can see this nicely in this, this CT series here where we've got a very severely affected French Bulldog and a completely unaffected French Bulldog. And this French Bulldog that's unaffected, again, the palate's quite a nice length here. So if anything, some of the brachycephalic dogs actually have shorter palates than you would expect, but it's also sitting in a nice place, okay? So it's not so thick and it sits nicely underneath the epiglottis. This is all soft palate. This big chunk of tissue here that's obliterating that nasopharynx is all soft palate, okay? Interestingly, if you were to look at these dogs, I'm not sure you'd be able to separate them from the way they looked and certainly not from the length of their nose, which looks very similar. You might get it from the length of the cranium here. OK, but isn't that interesting that that this bit doesn't seem to make much difference. Now, the macroglossia is another area that people have been looking at. There's been some really nice studies over the last couple of years that have shown this is particularly an issue in French bulldogs and bulldogs. And you've got not just a higher tongue volume, but it's also more dense, okay? So, and particularly at the base of the tongue. Now, I was also surprised the pugs didn't show the same, actually, because the pugs' tongues tend to be very long and they're often flopping out of the mouths, but they're not so thick at the base, okay? So the macroglossia seems to be more the bulldogs. And remember, guys, that the French bulldog and the bulldog are very similar. They originated um, the French bulldog from the bulldog and the toy terrier, whereas the pug is a different lineage. It's an Asian lineage. So it's not unusual for you to get different lesions in these different dogs. So a little bit further back and we are at the larynx. And this is how you would like the larynx to look. So this is a beautiful larynx and you've got the vocal folds coming out just behind these um, cuneiform processes, okay? So the cuneiform processes and then the vocal folds, epiglottis down here, and then the um, ventricles sit just in front of the vocal folds down here. Now, unfortunately, what we tend to get in our guys is a laryngeal collapse. And this is a typical pug, the middle. These are um, Professor Octring's images, they're beautiful. And this is a typical pug here. And what happens with the pug, it tends to get a functional collapse of that larynx. Um, and it is functional because if you take some of the pressure away further up the airway, then you can improve this. Um, and the pug's got quite a soft cartilage, um, but you get folding of the cuneiform processes initially. And then as it gets worse, then the whole corniculate processes fold as well. OK, um, this is the ventricle eversion that we tend to see uh, in the French bulldogs as well and the bulldogs. Uh, but this is very much a pug picture. Now, if you see this in a French bulldog or a bulldog, you've got a huge problem because in a pug, this is dynamic, but in the French bulldog and the bulldog, it's irreversible. OK, so so it's a, again a breed difference there. So this again is the pug. OK, so this is what's happening. So inspiration. 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 This isn't laryngeal paresis. It's not laryngeal paralysis. This is just soft functional collapse because you've got excessive inspiratory pressures. OK, so if you tweak other bits of the airway, you may improve this. Um, and here we go with the ventricle. So these are the little pockets of mucosa that sit just in front of those vocal folds. And these are averted. And once these are out, they're out, guys. There was a lovely study done by Cantatori, and he took one out, left the other in, came back, and it was still out. Now, the other thing that we look at is the trachea. And that hyperplastic trachea, that tiny trachea, is particularly significant in the bulldog. Um, also a little bit in the Frenchie, but this is more of a bulldog issue. Um, you're also seeing this in the Boston Terriers as well. And unfortunately, we often see this in the young puppies and they present with aspiration pneumonia. And when we see them, we tend to treat them conservatively. So we don't tend to even sedate or, or anaesthetize them. We tend to try and manage them just with oxygen, non steroidals or steroids and antibiotics. If you can nurse them through these episodes, often when they get older, that trachea does expand a little bit and you will have dogs that don't have huge amounts of functional disease. So I, I usually pull them back in at 12 months of age to see if they need surgery and they don't all need surgery. So um, this is a bulldog issue, um, but if they have this, I certainly don't want them to be bred from because I think this is a, one of the main contributors of BOAS in the bulldog. Now you don't see this in the pug because the pug has got a much wider um, um, trachea with often a quite a wide dorsal tracheal membrane. So the pug trachea is more likely to get collapse. Uh, the bulldog and French bulldog trachea does not collapse because the rings overlap each other. So it's a rigid structure, um, but it tends to be quite small. And then we get secondary changes. So we can see hiatal hernias. 
um, which we've got here with the with the cardio of the stomach up here, or we can see reflux, we see esophageal motility issues, uh, we can see diverticular in front of the heart. So there's there's a lot of secondary issues um, that, that unfortunately are related to the upper airway obstruction. So what about disease recognition? Well, when we started this off, it tended to be quite subjective. So it was really based on clinical signs. But when I looked at the textbooks, it tended to just describe respiratory noise, exercise intolerance, but it wasn't really clearly defined. And I think that was an issue, okay. And also you're often expecting people to pick this up in an annual veterinary examination when you're also checking anal glands and vaccinating and talking about weight loss. So I, I think it's difficult to really nail this in a 15 minute consult when you're trying to do everything else. We originally devised an objective respiratory function test, and we then used that to develop a functional grading scheme that you can do um, um, in practice without any additional uh, resource. So I'll talk about those. Now, the other reason that the, the clinical signs tend to be quite subjective is that you tend to react differently to different dogs. So this is a dog with, with moderate balance. <laughs> This dog's got obvious nasal nasopharyngeal certain. But many people will ignore that or even think it's quite cute. This is a bulldog. This has also got moderate BOAS, but most people will react to that in a much more aggressive way than they'll react to the pug because the pug just doesn't look quite so dramatic. So even when you know what you're doing, it's very easy to overlook the pugs, if I'm being honest. And I still find it very difficult to work out which dog um, is affected by looking at them. So here you go, guys. There is, there is one grade three in this lot. Um, there's a grade zero as well, okay? So which one do you think is the grade three dog? So there you go, guys. Another question on screen for you. Lots of people answering already, which is great. Can I just say that I'm rubbish at this, okay? So if you show me dogs, sometimes I get it right, but often I don't, okay? So that's just over half of our audience have submitted an answer. So we'll just leave that on screen for another 10 or 15 seconds. Okay, that's about two thirds of our audience. So I will end that poll and show you the results. So you can see on screen there, Jane, 68% of those yeah. who answered said C. C. So, so <laughs> I'm actually quite impressed with the 15% that got this right, okay, because because B is the severely affected dog, okay? And um, I'm not sure I'd have got that right. Now, I think I would have said that D is a zero. Why would I have said D is a zero? because actually D's got quite a thin head, okay? So D's got a thin head and it's got, he's got, sorry, a slightly longer nose. So I quite like D, but for the people that said C, absolutely. You know, that dog's got quite a thick nasal, nasal roll. It's got quite wide eyes. It's showing it's clearer. It's a thick head, right? So I, I would not have got this right, okay? Um, I quite like A as well, because it's got a longer nose. Um, so D and A, I probably would have said, okay, they look quite decent, but I would never have been able to distinguish between B and C, okay. So, so looking at these dogs isn't going to give you the answer, okay. So, this is the test that we came up with, and I looked at a whole different um, kind of a, a whole different load of tests before we came up with this. So, we looked at face masks, which most pet dogs wouldn't tolerate. We looked at respiratory bands, which just fell off the bulldog. So, I spent a whole year prattling around before we came up with this. But this is whole body plasm plasmography. And what we have here is we have a, a chamber and you have biased airflow across it and it gives you a respiratory flow trace. And we needed um, 20 breaths at quite a low respiratory rate to get meaningful data. And we were very lucky in the fact that we started with the show dogs and they were very used to being crated. 
And initially the breeders said, this is not going to work. You know, you cannot put our dogs in there. They'll be really scared. And the breeders were really annoyed about it. And the dogs weren't. OK, so we were very lucky that we managed to get the data we needed. And we got these respiratory flow traces. And this is inspiration. This is expiration. And for a few years, we could see that we had a big variation in the traces in different dogs. So this dog here is completely unaffected French Bulldog. And this is a very nice trace. This is the same kind of trace that I would see in a Labrador or a Beagle. OK, so looking at this trace, I'm pretty confident that dog's you know, got nice respiratory function. This is one of our French Bulldogs with a fixed obstruction. So this could be nasal, it could be nostril, it could be trachea, okay? But there's, there's something that limits the flow, um, both inspiration and expiration in this. And this is a dynamic trace. And this is when you've got something that's, that's obstructing and causing a valve effect. And this is typically the soft palate, but it could be nasopharyngeal or pharyngeal collapse, okay? So, so we could look at these traces for a few years, work out that we had a problem. Um, but actually this is where Nightchase um, PhD came in, in so helpfully because she managed to work out a way of giving these traces, um, looking at the data and numeric score. And we used six respiratory parameters. So we used expiratory time over inspiratory time. We used peak expiratory flow over peak inspiratory flow. And we used minute volume over body weight. And the key to the data, if anybody's interested, isn't just the um, mean, it's the actual standard deviation of that data as well. And that's an interesting thought actually now that had I realized this a few years ago, you can spot the really affected dogs because they have a very erratic breathing pattern. And we went a little bit wrong for a year or so because we were looking at the human COPD um, data. So uh, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but humans that have pulmonary disease have very, very restricted conservative breathing patterns. And actually our guys with their upper respiratory obstruction have a completely different pattern. And you'll watch them, they'll take a few little breaths and then they'll have a dig deep breath. And, and you can see the irregularity as they get more severely affected. Um, but it's only when you look at the data and you put it in graphs that you spot that kind of thing. Now, from this, we then looked at a functional grading system. So the, the plasmography data is really nice, um, but to get a plasmography reading takes us about 60 to 90 minutes. And the show dogs are typically better than the pet dogs. Um, and it's expensive. Um, and actually, although the equipment isn't that expensive, the equipment's about 30,000, you need somebody to do those tests. So it's, it's intensive as far as nursing goes. And um, it does correlate really well with our clinical assessment. So we realized that the, the you know, what we were saying the dog was clinically and the plasmography data had a really nice correlation. So we kind of came up with this as a grading system. And originally I devised this to really help the breeders to say which dogs they shouldn't be breeding with until we get the genetics. And genetics are underway, but I still think they're a couple of years off. So so I don't think the genetics will, will be there yet. And when they do, it's going to be estimated breeding values, which means that, you know, you're not going to have a simple test to say yes or no. You're going to have to work out parentage and, and risks. So I think this is helpful. Now, what we've said with our grading system is that our grade zero dogs have got no noise at all when you listen to them with a stethoscope over the pharynx before or after exercise. So there is nothing, okay? The grade one dogs have got a mild noise, so you can only hear it with the stethoscope before or after exercise. We also let the Frenchies through that snort, okay? So you get occasional snorting Frenchies, but when they're breathing normally, um, then there's no noise. The grade two dogs, you can hear without the stethoscope. So if you've got a dog who is breathing before or after exercise and you can hear constant noise, um, then that is a grade two. And then the grade three dogs have got moderates to severe stertor, but they've also got inspiratory effort and they've usually got dyspnea and cyanosis. So the grade three dogs um, are a little bit more, uh, well, obviously more affected. And it's typically that dyspnea that gives them away. Now, the exercise that we do with these guys, I'll just come down. I managed to miss a slide there. I think I've just managed to jump somehow. Sorry, guys, I just jumped there a little bit. Ah, so the functional grading system, it's based on an exercise test and we're listening for certain noises. And the noises we're listening for are either stertor or strider, okay? So stertor is a low pitch noise. Typically, 
pharyngeal can be nasopharyngeal. Laryngeal strider is high pitched. <laughs> So we typically think of strider as soaring wood, okay? So it's a little bit higher pitched. And then this is also stir, so this is nasal stir. So you can tell it's from a different location, but we still count that as a stir turn, okay? So those are the noises we are using um, when we're listening um, and grading these dogs. <laughs> Um, and we have defined these noises now. So stirter is almost um, low pitch vibratory noise, commonly described as a awake snoring. OK, so that's stirter, awake snoring. Strider, higher pitched, harsh respiratory noise localizes to the larynx or the trachea, and it's usually inspiratory. OK, so we've been trying to be quite um, careful about how we talk about these noises. Now, inspiratory effort is extra effort required to inhale. And what we are saying is either a longer inspiratory time, increased movement of the chest wall or billowing of the thoracic inlet, which is particularly what you see in pugs. And then dyspnea. Now, I got into trouble for dyspnea because dyspnea is a description of suffering. And people say that dogs can't suffer, but I think they can. So the way we've described this is severely increased inspiratory effort with signs of discomfort, such as a rigid stance with elbow adduction tense facial expression and particularly the lack of normal social behaviors. So dyspnea is those dogs that can just think about breathing. They can't do anything else but concentrate on breathing. Okay. So this is a nice stirter. That's a nasal stirter. This is more of a pharyngeal stirter. This is your strider. This is more subtle, but it's still a strider. This is Strider in the French Bulldog and the Bulldog, okay? So it tends to be more significant when you see it in these breeds. So this usually indicates either irreversible laryngeal collapse or laryngeal swelling. This is dyspnea. So this dog's got the elbows abducted, abdominal effort, and all it's thinking about is how to breathe. And then this is, to me, excessive respiratory effort. <laughs> So now we've introduced some noises. I'm going to ask you guys where this noise is coming, OK? Because we've talked about the most obvious noises, and then there's always a couple that are annoying, OK? So where do we think this noise is from? So, Rachel, can we poll now? Is that... Oh, fantastic. You guys are on this. Yep, on it. I could feel everybody itching with their fingers to get their <laughs> answers in. <clears throat> that's, over, yeah. <clears throat> that's over two thirds of our audience who've given answers. So we'll just leave that up for another few seconds. So guys, I'm going to play it again. So I would say for this one, I would say nostril, okay? So nasal potentially a little bit. Let's just go back. 
Let's see if I can get that again. But mainly nostrils, okay? Because it's sucking in and it's quite high pitch, but it's not a laryngeal strider. Okay? That to me is predominantly nostril. And the reason it's worth just pointing that out is because I wouldn't grade a dog as severely affected because of that being a strider, okay? Because that's a, na a, a nostril one to me rather than a laryngeal, okay? Okay, let's just get you down. So that's our answers on screen from the audience. Thank you. And then this one, guys, just to make sure that we're happy with this. <coughs> we're pulling it in now, if that's all right. <coughs> Perfect. Let's stop that because it's quite upsetting. So you guys have got this right. So that's a laryngeal strider, and that I would react to, okay? And you really only see laryngeal strider in the French bulldog or the bulldog when you have severe disease, okay? So you can pretty much guarantee that laryngeal strider is severe disease and a grade three. And that's such a strong association that we haven't even kept it in the grading system because you just don't see such severe strider without them being dyspneic or having severe stertor. Okay, so well done, guys. You're doing really well. Okay, nice. Now, there's a couple of other things just to point out. When we are evaluating these dogs, we have their heads in a neutral position. It's really important that we are not pressing up. Um, because if we press up, we're likely to cause noise. And we're not trying to cause noise. We're trying to work out what's there in a neutral position. And we listen to them before or after the exercise tolerance test. Um, and the tolerance test is a three minute jog. So it's a slow jog. And I try and do this myself um, because you learn a lot. So most bulldogs start to make noise if they're affected about two minutes. Um, there are some French bulldogs that are noisier before than afterwards because once you exercise and they start to mouth breathe and beforehand you may have had nasal stertor. So you learn a lot from watching these dogs exercise. Okay, Now you get the occasional breeder who knows exactly what they're doing and they'll stretch the dog's head up. And I don't see anything, I just wait. And at some stage, the head drops down and I get it, okay? So, so it is quite funny, but, but just I usually don't engage, I just wait. And at some stage, that head will drop and I can listen to them in a neutral position. Now, the reason we do the exercise test is because we see these kind of dogs. So this is a, a bit, mm. little bit of nostril mm. noise there, okay? Mm. And she's gonna be a great mm. two, but you know, not particularly dramatic. Mm. This is after a three minute test, just a three minute trot, okay? Mm. Mm. You've even got Strider coming there. And then this is the same dog. And 30 minutes later, it's completely recovered. Playing around here with my, it's completely recovered from its, let me just get rid of that. It's exercise, it's almost asleep in the consult room and there's barely any noise, okay? Now, the breeders originally would say to us, well, you're causing my dog to have disease, but that's not true, right? Most dogs should be able to exercise for three minutes without sounding like that. And we know that now because we're seeing bulldogs coming through that are perfectly okay after exercise, okay? So we have a range of, of respiratory functions in these breeds, and that's amazing because if we hadn't done, we'd have been stuck, right? But there are very good breeders um, in all of our three breeds. We have lots of good um, grade zero dog. Out of there. Now there are different exercise tests around so you can also do how far can you walk in six minutes um, or some people are doing um, exercise um, of um, uh, seeing how the, quickly they recover after um, six minutes or a, a kilometer. Um, you, I don't think it matters. I think all exercise tests are better than nothing. However, we did look at this and we are more sensitive at diagnosing BOAS um, on the trot versus the walk. So this is a graph that's important to us. And this is us trotting the dogs versus walking the dogs for the same distance. And we are more sensitive with bias diagnosis with that trot than the walk, okay? So, and also three minutes isn't very long. So if I do this in a three minute, and then I listen to the dogs before and afterwards, I can do this in 15 minutes. So it's a pretty fast way of evaluating these dogs. And it seems to be a relatively sensitive exercise test. Now, for years also, I was teaching people um, that the strider was laryngeal, and then I realized I got no evidence for that. So then we looked at strider, and what we found was if you hear strider, you can pretty much guarantee, let me just nip back, you can pretty much guarantee that it is 
<laughs> Sometimes it just doesn't work as you want it to, does it? But... <laughs> So if you hear that noise, then it pretty much is um, laryngeal. Um, but some dogs with laryngeal disease, unfortunately, don't show strider. OK, so it's very specific, but it's not completely um, sensitive. But it is more sensitive after exercise than before. OK, so you are better exercising the dogs and listening for strider. OK, and once you hear that strider, you know you've got a laryngeal issue. So it's definitely worth doing to your patients before surgery, for example, so that you know which ones uh, you might have to do the ventricles on. Now. Once Nietzsche had done the PhD work, then we had some um, measurements that we looked at and we came out with confirmational um, factors that we could use to help the breeders decide what we wanted to breed. And this is what we've come up with. So in all of our breeds, the stenosis of the nostrils is the most important factor. OK, so open nostrils is top. Um, and then in the bulldog, particularly the male, it's a thicker neck. We're better at measuring neck than we are at measuring width of head. So the thicker neck probably reflects the thicker head or the wider head, but it's a better ratio. And the ratio between the chest and the head of about 0.7 is a nice cutoff for a male bulldog, whether they're going to get boas or not. OK, so we want dogs that have got a decent length of neck and not too thick. And again, the wider and the shorter skull is significant. Um, we found more males affected, but I think that I think males probably is in the bulldogs. Yes. Um, but we, we kind of also see quite a few papers now where they say the gender is not so important. Now, in the pugs, again, it's nostrils and then it's obesity. So weight in pugs is super important. And then it's width of the eyes. Um, and again, that probably reflects the width of the skull. OK. Um, so again, width of the head may be more important than the length, but that's maybe because we don't have a lot of variation in nose length in some of these breeds. In the Frenchie, again, nostrils first, and then it was the thicker and the shorter neck. So we want, again, dogs with a nice long neck, um, shorter and wider skull, and then the shorter muzzle. So it wasn't significant, but there was a definite trend to having more severe boas with the shorter muzzle. So a longer nose definitely in the French bulldog. And it's interesting because I've always looked at this and thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if boas was linked to back disease? And if you improve boas, you improve back disease. And there's a study recently come out by the Nationwide Insurance, and they've looked at thousands of dogs, and they found that dogs that have extreme, extreme brachys that have BOAS are more likely to get disc disease. And I thought that was quite nice because I, I only looked at this area. This has taken me long enough. But it would be really lovely if some of these disease traits were tied in together. And if you improve one, then you improve all of them. Now, the body condition score in pugs has never been very easy for me because they've got all this loose skin around their neck. So we came up with the breeders one afternoon and they were very helpful. They brought us a load of fat dogs and we photoshopped these dogs. And we've come up with the idea that eights and nines are no longer welcome in the ring because they're obese. And we want them to have four, fives and sixes in the ring. Seven is still probably accepted in the ring, although I still think seven's too fat. They think four's too thin. So we're, we're kind of working on this, right? Um, but certainly we don't want to see these eights and nines. And when you look at the plasmography data, um, for every body condition score that is increased in a pug, you put about 7% BOAS index on those dogs. So if the BOAS index cutoff for affected or unaffected is about 50%, you know, if you if you take a dog that's a body condition score nine and you change it to a six, you're taking 30 percent pretty much. Um, sorry, not 30 percent, 20 percent off that BOAS index. And you can easily knock that down to unaffected from moderate or from um, severe to moderate. So obesity in a pug is a real issue. Now, we have launched the grading scheme as a official um, breeder scheme with the um, Kennel Club. And um, what we've said to them is you must not breed your grade threes. And we've stayed with the grade threes at the moment because the grade threes for us is about 10 to 15 percent of our breed. And that's quite a chunk to take out initially. But we've said if you are going to breed your grade twos and the grade twos are about 30 percent, then you should grade them, breed them with only grade zeros or ones. And um, I think this is sensible. I think if we cut our grade twos too fast, then you may risk bringing other diseases up. So, so I think you have to be a little bit moderate about how you treat these breeds. And what we're hoping is in about five years, then we've got rid of most of our grade threes, and then we can come and split the grade twos uh, because there are definitely good grade twos and bad grade twos. So it'd be nice to split those, okay? But this is where we are at the moment. Now we've looked at this recently and of the grade three dogs that were tested over the last 
um, two, three years, 85% of them were not bred. Okay, well, 15% were bred, which is poor, but 85% weren't bred. So, so it does seem to be getting the message across. And um, hopefully we can, and the people that then bred them were then asked by the kennel club why they bred them. So, so the pressure was on. So this is, this is a, it's a step forward. Okay, this is a step in the right direction. Um, the good breeders usually are engaging pretty well and they don't want to breed unhealthy dogs the problem we have is the, is the breeders that are doing this for commercial profit and uh, we've still got some way to go on that but it's a start okay now what else are we going to do with these dogs what about the ones that need treatment well we're going to look at the history and the clinical signs we're going to do the functional grading test the whole body barometric plasmography is a nice tool to have but it's absolutely not essential and then we'll talk about imaging as well. And it depends a little bit on the owner budget. Now, what are the clinical signs that we're interested in? Uh, excessive respiratory noise, exercise intolerance, uh, particularly if there's a variation between the summer and the winter, um, collapse cyanosis, regurgitation and vomiting, sleep disorders, it's this kind of thing. So the dog will be choking itself awake, or will have frequent episodes where you can see the chest moving and then there's no actual air passage and we see this a lot particularly in french bulldogs and, bulldogs, okay? and then sometimes excessive salivation because some of these dogs will have silent regurgitation um, and this is another thing that's wrong when you have dogs that sit up and sleep excessively during the daytime dogs don't normally sleep sitting up okay they sleep sitting up because they're trying to stop pressure on their pharynx so so this is not a good sign and then we have some of these guys that come and they they sleep with toys in their mouths because their noses are obstructed and they've sorted it out but it's a little bit sad okay but this is a uh, you know way this dog's managed to keep his oral pathway open and um, when he's asleep um, eating disorders we've got the choking on the food eating slowly regurgitation excessive flatulence and then the silent regurgitation okay so these are all the things we're asking about um, and I think the eating disorder, the slow and the choking are ones that people often think are just because the animal is gobbling its food, but it isn't, you know, it's because they've got excessive tissue at the back of their throat. Now, exercise tolerance, we're looking at duration, time for recovery, difference between winter and summer, and then any collapse. And just be careful, guys, it's easy to get fixated on the boat. Um, this dog was sent to me for a nasal turbinectomy, but look, it's snake. It's got air hunger when it's mouth breathing. I was about to take this dog outside and exercise it when I noticed that it had air hunger. It had completely a clear passage of air to me there and it was cyanotic. So we whipped it back inside and it had tetralogy of fallow. OK, so it is easy sometimes to just focus on, on the one aspect that you're really thinking about and to not look at the, um, the other systems. Um, so, yeah, if they, if they sound clear, then you're probably fine. Now, I think we should do some kind of thoracic imaging, um, whether it's CT or whether it's radiographs, it doesn't really matter. Um, but we're looking for that tracheal size. We're also looking for any evidence of aspiration pneumonia. And if we can see aspiration pneumonia and the patient is stable and it's an elective procedure, it is probably worth waking them up and holding and coming back in a few weeks time, okay? Because we don't wanna make these um, anesthetics any more complicated. Um, Laryngoscopy is really useful. So evaluating your tonsils, the soft palate um, is, is a really good step forward. Obviously laryngeal function. And then I like rhinoscopy. We do do CT of the head. It's useful for a prognostic um, indicators, but will it change what you do? Probably not, okay? So it's nice to have, but it, you know, when people talk about gold standard imaging, I think, well, well, how do you define it with a gold standard imaging? We don't have, you know, amounts that the soft palate should be, the thickness of the soft palate. We don't have the nasopharyngeal dimensions that are linked to disease. So we don't have that criteria for the imaging um, to say in a 15 kilo bulldog, it's going to be this or in a 30 kilo bulldog, it's going to be that. OK, so so imaging will support your diagnosis, but you don't make your diagnosis on the imaging. We originally used to do radiographs because we were doing the morphology of the head. OK, so that's why we were doing them. Um, but it's not also so clear. Right. So this is a. a unaffected pug this is a beautiful pug we've got a nice thin soft palate here we've got a decent nasopharynx here okay this is a completely affected pug a 93 percent grade three so it's pretty much as bad as it gets and we've got a really thickened soft palate here for a pug and we've got very compressed turbinates here okay so yes okay this is clear one of these bulldogs is severely affected the other is completely clear 
And I don't think I'll be able to tell you which is which, okay? So actually the one that is completely unaffected is this bulldog here. And it has a nice big trachea and it's also really obese, okay? And this bulldog was fine, but look at the size of the nasopharynx. Uh, this bulldog was severely affected, okay? Grade three, and I guess the palate's a little bit longer, but I don't know if I would be able to tell you if you gave me these images, which one was the most severely affected. Now, trachea and bronchia, yep, yeah, nice to have a look at that trachea. Good idea to look at the lung function and if there's any aspiration. Um, however, you know, radiographs will do fine, okay? Now, we occasionally do pick things up which are interesting. So this is a, a little pug that's got a lung lobe torsion. Typically, it's a left cranial lung lobe uh, because you do get a little bit of bronchial collapse often in that area. And I couldn't pick this up clinically because the dog had severe BOAS. It had um, collapsed over a weekend, came in very dyspneic, but all you could hear was the BOAS. So it's easy to miss this. So I think thoracic imaging is sensible. This is another little pug that had a very nice airway um, confirmationally, but it's got a benign nasal tumor here, which is causing its signs of BOAS. Okay, now this regressed, but we did trim the palate to help a little bit in the meantime. So this is an angioma, you see them in humans and they will usually resolve themselves, but this explains why quite a nice pug had an airway problem. Um, I think if I was gonna choose CT or rhinoscopy, I'd probably go for rhinoscopy. So you get a lot of information from your scope. Um, you can look at your turbinates, you can look at your palates, you can look at your tracheas, really quite a nice bit of kit. So I'd probably go for this first, and it's a huge amount cheaper, if I'm being honest. Now, once we know what we're doing, what are we going to do for these guys? Well, we've got um, lifestyle management. So uh, uh, first one is losing weight um, and then keeping them cool, not excessively exercising them. Um, we can sort out some of these with antacids. So if they've got a, um, a real reflux and that's causing laryngeal swelling, um, then you can sometimes get the airway much improved if you get the reflux under control. Um, and then we've got surgery, okay? And that's where I am, I'm going next because that's kind of my area. So there's lots of different bits that we can look at now. So we've got the, the palettes, this is a folding flap. Uh, we've got the turbinectomies, the diode laser, uh, the new nostril techniques that we're using. Um, and then we've got the larynx where we're doing the cuneiformectomies. Um, so different bits we can hit. Now, I guess the first question is, which of these dogs would you say is definitely a surgical case? Okay, so the grade three severely affected, the old grade two dogs, the young grade one dogs, or the puppies with stenotic nostrils. It's really nice to have such an engaged audience. Thanks, guys. I was just going to say, it's lovely to yeah, see how yeah. quickly people are getting on their buttons. It's fabulous. Yeah, you, you know, I'm sitting everyone. here looking at my bedroom wall because my, my kind of um, office in the shed, the, the Wi-Fi fell over early on. So I'm sitting in my bedroom looking at the walls and then this is good because I can feel people now. It's like this. So that's 60% of our audience have submitted an answer. We'll just leave that up for another few seconds. So for me, guys, I like to operate on the severely affected dogs. Let me just go back, see if I can get that video to work. So this is my ideal surgical case, really, because I'm going to make it better. Okay? So this one I'm definitely going to go for, right? Now, some of the old grade two dogs, particularly if they're pugs, I tend to diet them, okay? And also I saw a grade two bulldog recently that actually was a grade two when he was about 12 months old and he's now 10 and he's still a grade two and he's absolutely stable. So I probably wouldn't react to him either, okay? He wasn't regurgitating, he had minimal signs. He's an old boy, I'd leave him alone. Now the puppies are interesting, okay? So I don't know about the puppies. Um, we don't know if there's any benefit in opening the nostrils, okay? So there is evidence in the Shih Tzu, which um, Bryden Stanley published with her group a few years ago, but not in any of the other breeds. And interestingly, I looked up the, <laughs> I found the ethics application for that study and it had in it French bulldogs, pugs and bulldogs. And yet the only one they published was the Shih Tzu. And I think that's because if you look at Shih Tzus, and I'm doing that at the moment, the Shih Tzu lesion is mainly nostril, okay? So you're tackling mainly a nostril issue, you're tackling the right bit, you're sorting it out. I suspect because the bulldog, you've got a lot of other things going on, particularly trachea and hyperplastic um, palate. I'm not sure you're going to resolve it if you just do the nostrils. Um, and the same thing with the French bulldog. 
So I don't typically go for just dogs that have got sonotic nostrils. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, you could argue you're going to make them breathe better. You might. But we see quite a few dogs that have got narrowed nostrils, so sonotic nostrils, moderately or severe, and they don't have clinical signs. Now, not so many got severe, but you do see occasional ones. Um, and also, I just worry about giving the breeders the impression that it doesn't matter what they do with the nostrils because we're going to tweak them as soon as we need to these dogs. And I don't like that message. I want the breeders to open the nostrils and I don't want to do that for them. So I don't tend to go for just narrowed nostrils. But, you know, something maybe the data will come out soon that says I should. Right. So I might be wrong about this, but but I, I'd like the message to get out there that you should breed better nostrils, not that we're going to tweak them. Now, I set my owner expectations pretty fast, if I'm being honest, and most dogs are improved. Some have got little response to conventional surgery, which for me is the palate and the nostrils. But you can usually spot those before your surgery um, because they've got the nasal obstruction. OK, so if you've got dogs that really can't breathe through their nose, they tend to be the regurgitators as well, with the sleep apneas. Then those guys, they might have a little bit of a response, but often not a big response. And the dogs have got a worse prognosis of those that present at a really young age, so usually about six to eight months of old age, often in a thin body condition and with laryngeal collapse. So with those guys, you need to have a very serious conversation with the owners um, about their expectations and about the quality of life for those dogs. Now, what do we do about hospitalizations? I try and avoid it. OK, so I try not to have them in the night before because um, I prefer to split my consult if I can from my surgical day um, so that they're literally walking in, getting pre-medded and going into theatre. Now, you can't always do that, um, but I think it's nice if you can. The dogs that are stressed, we are definitely using trazodone. And um, it does seem to have some effects. So again, if you can just reduce some of that anxiety, because for us, temperament is also a prognostic indicator. So the really stressy dogs are the ones that are not doing so well. OK, so so we try to load them with trazodone. The aggressive French bulldogs, those males, we load, we load them with trazodone and gabapentin. OK, so, so the really nasty ones we are deb doubly loading at the moment. And then we try not to take too many things into the hospital. But if they have sleep aids, then those need to come in. Okay, and then we typically will give a meprazole preoperatively. Um, I will give a meprazole to dogs um, about five to seven days before the surgery if they are frequent regurgitators. And by frequent regurgitators, I mean dogs that are regurgitating daily or more. Okay, so one or two or more times a day, absolutely fine. If it's once or twice a week, I tend not to because many of our French bulldogs tend to react to a meprazole. About 25% of them tend to get gastrointestinal side effects. So, so I use it for the frequent regurgitators, but and, and not all of them, you know, if it's a weekly thing. They don't react to the IV a meprazole, so you can still give it an induction, um, but I only give it orally beforehand if they are, if they are regurgitating frequently. I always pre um, I use steroids at induction, and I use a well-cuffed ET tube, not a massive ET tube. I don't like a huge amount of pressure on that trachea or larynx. So it's a well-cuffed, but not the biggest tube. And also that means you can move the tube up when you're doing the ventricles without having to extubate them, which I really like. Okay. Um, Post-op analgesia, we are using paracetamol. We are using local blocks. I tend to not give them opioids afterwards. Okay. And I really don't like sedating them afterwards if I can avoid it. Now, these are annoying. These are the silent regurgis. So often the owners don't even notice this, okay? Um, but they're just bathing their airway in, in acid, okay? And these can cause you a few problems. So these are the ones that we're giving preoperative omeprazole to. And then we'll also use metoclopramide. And we tend to continue that as a constant rate of fusion after the surgery until they go home. And often I will give them oropitant as well. Now the feeding, I don't think we've teased this one out yet. Um, but we used to be told you had to starve them before the surgery and a lot of people were starving them afterwards. And I used to starve them um, for about at least 12 hours after the surgery because I was told that the laryngeal and pharyngeal muscles um, took time to recover, which is probably true. However, I also know now that if you don't feed them, then you tend to also increase their feeling as nausea. So we do now give them a tiny little bit of food, um, often low fat, a little bit of, of chicken or fish, um, usually about four or five hours after they've had their surgery. And then if they're eating normally, they're looking great. Um, I'm actually a little bit more relaxed than, than starving them overnight. The tricky ones are the emergency cases, the bulldogs or the French bulldogs with laryngeal strider. 
the frequent regurgitators, the high stress patients for us are also tricky. And then there was a really nice brisk study um, done by the American guys and, and particularly Amit Singh a few years ago, where they showed the previous surgery was also a risk factor, which makes sense, but inappropriate body temperature and admission. So low body temperature, which I would not have picked up on. Okay. So that was a nice study to look at as well. Um, we pre-med them, but we just keep an eye on them. So once they are pre-medded, they're with us, if that makes sense. So we'll pre-med them and then we'll be setting up theatre, we'll be setting up CT, but we don't put them back in their kennel. Um, at the moment, I'm using dexmedetomidine and methadone. And I think that's a really nice combination. So that's my favourite one. Um, you can also use acepromazine and opiates, um, but I'm more of a med uh, dexmedetomidine person, if I'm being honest. Um, I always use local anaesthetic nerve blocks. I like the maxillary nerve block. I think it works really beautifully. And it seems to, I mean, this isn't proven, although there's been a nice paper out of Dick White's recently that suggested it does help a lot. But I think it does also desensitize the, the um, palate. So I get far fewer dogs gulping on me these days than I used to. Um, I'm using otravine, which is um, xylometazoline, which is a nasal decongestant. And then I'm using intravenous induction agents. Um, we occasionally use alfaxalam, but we're often still using propofol, okay, and I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, we looked at the difference between acepromazine and opiates and dexmedetomidine and opiates, and it didn't really cause any difference for us with plasmography. They all cause significant respiratory depression. So we couldn't really pick up you know, a huge difference between these agents, but you do have to really watch what's happening with these guys because it's remarkable how much you hit the respiratory function with sedatives. Now, the other thing I do now is I'm very careful about my duration, particularly in the severely affected dogs. Um, so I think there was a, there's been a few really nice studies out over the last few years. And one of the studies basically came up with an increased risk of about 11% um, with every 15 minutes of anesthesia. So with those severely affected dogs, I just don't wanna take the risk. And if you separate neutering from the airway and do the airway first, you can come back and check your surgical site, um, which is really nice. OK, so you can see exactly how your palate's um, healed and, and how it's all going and then do other procedures at a later date. So if the owner has the budget, it's better to split. Uh, we always pre um, and typically for us, it's a flow by rather than a mask because I find the dogs tolerate it a little bit better. Um, and then I have a selection of tubes around. Um, usually the dogs are relatively okay to intubate once you've got the epiglottis down. Now, I had a debate with the anaesthetist recently because I'm always told you can't touch the epiglottis with your endoscope. And actually, with a curved laryngoscope blade, you don't need to because that will pull the epiglottis down. But the straight um, laryngoscope blades are designed by the human medics to go on top of the epiglottis. So they said you can't touch the epiglottis because you're going to traumatize it. I've never seen that. And I want to see the larynx. So if I'm struggling, I'm happy to put the laryngoscope blade on the epiglottis. And I don't perceive there to be an issue with that. And rather do that and see the epiglottis than be going blind. Okay. I use a large cotton buds quite a lot to remove excess saliva um, and I'll always have suction around just in case we get any aspiration or regurgitation. Um, I do need monitoring around. It makes me feel happy. Otherwise, I get a little bit twitchy. So minimum for me is capnography, ECG and pulse oximetry. Um, and then even though I've got great anaesthetists or great anaesthetic nurses, I always have one eye on what's happening. OK, some of these dogs do some weird, wonderful things. You get the occasional vasovagal episode. Um, so I always have half an eye on the anaesthetic machine. These are my local nerve blocks. So I'm going just underneath the zygomatic arch where it curves down. And I usually use 0.1 mils per kilo of lidocaine or bupivacaine. And I tend to use bupivacaine because it lasts a little bit longer. Um, and it tends to be very simple and gives you a really nice block. Um, I'm not very good with anesthesia, but I do use a ventilator if, if I have to. And sometimes you get those annoying dogs that just pant and then their end tidal CO2 starts to rise above 65 and it's just hassle. And for those guys, I put them on the Penlon and I think that makes a massive difference. Okay, now there's a lot of other sophisticated ventilators you can use, but the Penlon is a mechanical ventilator. It's cheap and cheerful and it does make a big difference. Okay, so just for some of those really annoying panty dogs that never settle, and their end titles going up and up and up, then it is worth maybe having a ventilator if you're doing a lot of these dogs. I tend to recover them in theatre. I like that the best because it's quiet, it's calm, it's just me and the nurse and the anaesthetist if I've got one. And we're basically, you know, in a really confined, nice area where I'm watching. 
And uh, what we tend to do is we'll check that we're ventilating well on room air um, and before we extubate. And then I usually don't extubate for a good five to 10 minutes until after I've finished my surgery. So that lets my nasal bleeding stop. Um, but it also means that by the time the dog wakes, wakes up, it usually comes around pretty quickly. Okay, And I want that transition from anesthetized uh, to conscious to be quite smooth and quite fast. Um, so this is me in theatre again. Now, we have tried different ways. We've got some great nurses and we occasionally can recover them in kennels if you wish. But this is my ideal, right? I'm in theatre. I've got everything I need ready. If anything goes wrong, we're, we're in a really nice situation to, to intubate these guys again. Now, this is the xylometazoline. This is the otravine. And we tend to use this um, 0.2 to 0.4 in each nostril. And it works for about eight hours. And it really um, decongests these guys beautifully. So it shrinks the nasal mucosa. It's a selective alpha-3 agonist. So it doesn't have any other effects. Um, and this does mean um, that we're giving this to most of our French bulldogs now, depending, independent of what procedure they're having, because why wouldn't you improve their nasal airflow um, if they're going to be anaesthetized? So even if they're coming for cruise ships or anything like that, we still give them xylomatazoline. Um, I will do preemptive tracheostomies if the larynx is horrendous, but I do clip quite a few just in case. OK, so I'll often clip, but I don't often do it now, um, but I like to pre-clip just in case. And then I want really nice exposure. Um, so I use loops and I use a nice light source here. Um, and this is this is actually the VI bar stance I've used here with this with the bar here. But I want to be able to see right to the back of the of the pharynx here. And uh, the reason I designed this stand with with um, VI is because I was fed up of having dogs strung up. OK, so this is a stand that we um, have now promoted with VI. And it's designed to crank open that mouth. It doesn't push up on the neck too much. And you're not stringing your necks up. You've got a ramp. So I'm trying not to put any pressure in case I've got any neck discs here. And then there's a hook up here. So you can push up the anesthetic tube, which means that the tube flips up out the way of the ventricles and the palate. So I thought about this and I'm happy with this. Um, and then when I have finished, I can drop this stand and I can do the nostrils without having to take the stand away. So for me, it's working really nicely. Uh, this is an American bulldog. It's a big head. OK, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with my stand now. So, yeah, this is this is this was because I was so fed up of, of dropping heads or having them wobbling around on 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 the strip stands. I start off with the tonsils. Um, the tonsils are often hypertrophied and, and they're extruded. So if you take them out, you're not only creating more space in that nasopharynx, but you also then get something to suit to the sides of your palate too. Okay, so I'm going to tension the side of my palate because I've taken out these tonsils. I like that. Now, there are lots of different ways of operating on the palate. And if you have a way that works, then absolutely fine. OK, they're all you know, described in the literature. We have short term outcomes for most of them and long term outcomes for very few. Um, this is the one I'm doing at the moment. It's a modified folding flap. I love it. Uh, I love it because it thins really nicely. So what you do is you do a U-shaped incision to the front of the tonsillar crypt. You then strip back the oral mucosa. Let's just go back. Um, so that you've just got the nasal mucosa. So it's a very thin nasal mucosa. And then you trim it off at the level where the natural back of the palate would be. And then you fold it over. So you've got about a centimeter, centimeter and a half of just thin mucosa here folded back on itself. And then I suture this to the palatine crypts here, uh, the tonsillar crypts, so that there's nothing hanging down at the back of the palate. And I think that's really important. You don't want anything down the back of the sides, okay? Now, if you're going to do this, you do need bipolar because you have vessels that are coming in here and here and they will bleed. OK, so you definitely need bipolar. I'm using this most of the time now, so you don't necessarily need it in all your pugs, um, but I'm definitely using it in my bulldogs and my French bulldogs. And I tend to do it in the pugs because I like dissecting out the palate and sorting out the blood vessels as I'm doing it. Um, is there an advantage? We don't know. It's certainly not proven. Um, however, um, now this palette's thicker anyway, okay, but this is one of my palettes, okay, so I did this before, before I started doing the folding flap, and the length is fine, but this is a big, thick palette, okay, this is, and then we then did a turbinectomy on it, which is why I've reseated it. This is one of our folding flaps, and it does make me feel better if the palette looks like that at the end of the surgery. Now, we do get occasional complications with palettes, I think we all do, um, but it's pretty low, okay, so you get some that swell up, um, and there's too much tissue down the sides here. Uh, this one's got a hole. This, I think, was a, a monopolar hole. And then we get occasional ones where you get dehiscence. Actually, I've only ever seen once. Um, but, you know, it is reported and, and you do occasionally get these issues. Now, what about that larynx? <coughs> So 
So I am still taking out the saccules or the ventricles because if you don't take them out, they're staying there, okay? And I don't want to leave these things in, okay? Now, there was a paper that had an increase in minor post-operative complications, but I don't think I see that, to be honest. And um, I don't want to leave it in because then whatever else you've done, you've still got that, that pressure on the remiglottis and that reduced remiglottis area. So there's a few things I do. So I have a, a nice exposure now. I wear my loops, which I really like. I've got some very long, fine dissecting scissors. Um, and these mean that I can take out my ventricles without that extubation, which I also really enjoy. OK, so it's worth having some nice dissecting scissors. This makes a big difference to me. Um, and I've also got some really nice needle holders that are delicate and long, which means I can get to the back of the palate without too many issues. OK. And yeah, this is this is just unacceptable to me. I just I just can't do that. <laughs> it's really funny. OK, so so I know there's papers out there that say it's controversial, but I'm still taking them out. Um, I'm also sometimes taking off this cuneiform process. Um, and this is not a difficult thing to do. We cut these off with um, scissors. Um, but if you're going to do this kind of surgery, you have to be ready um, to treat the dogs if necessary. OK, now, when you do this, you're not increasing the diameter of the remiglottis. But what you are doing is stopping that functional collapse of the cuneiform. Okay? So quite like this, but, but just be ready to, to have to intubate. OK, saying that this is a dog that was just in a bilateral cuneiform ectomy on. We're just coming out of theatre. We've got minimal effort here. Nice and pink. So many of them are absent. This was her three or four hours later. So many of them are absolutely fine, but you do just have to anticipate you may get the occasional. Now, the nostrils, I've changed to um, Professor Ochtring's technique from Leipzig, and it's a bit radical. So this is the wedge, the traditional wedge, and this is the new ALO vestibular plasty. And what we do initially is we cut um, from medial to lateral at the bottom of the, of the um, ALO fold here. And then we join up our cuts by coming over the top of the ALAR fold. So initially we're going to cut across and then we're going to put an 11 blade around and connect those cuts. OK, um, so initially we take out the ALAR fold and then we come and do the traders and we slightly angle our blade. So you see um, less um, submucosa tissue and more pigment and they do bleed. They bleed for about 10 minutes after this. But by the time I've woken them up, then the bleeding is pretty much stopped. OK. So this is what it looks like. So I'm initially just opening up that nostril. I'm clamping very superficially on the ALOG hole, but quite a long way in. Uh, yes. That's my 11 blade. No. And it goes round, okay? And then once I've done that, I'm coming across, I'm slightly angling this 11 blade. And I'm just cutting off that end, okay? Now, this is a little bit brutal, guys. I have to be honest, it is brutal. Uh, why are we doing it? Because also it looks a bit scabby initially, whereas the wedge looks quite nice. We're doing it because we're seeing these, okay, where you've got, this is a wedge. It's had a, a, a very good wedge done by, by a specialist surgeon. I've got loads of these videos now, I collect them. But this is now, unfortunately, a large fold. So this is a large fold, still a large fold, and this is still a large fold. And there's the rostral abdominal So I'm not sure how much good that wedge did that dog, to be honest. And there was a nice abstract by one of the Cambridge residents this year at ECVS. And even if you think you're doing a deep wedge, you're not anywhere near as effective as if, as if you take out the ALR fold. Now that ALR fold technique is a little bit brutal, guys, and you want to practice it first before you do this in a live dog, okay? And they look like this afterwards, but I've not had an owner complain yet. OK, so as long as they know what's coming, they're absolutely fine. And four weeks after surgery, they look beautiful. OK, so uh, I'm not too worried about the owners uh, responding to these and they do heal beautifully. OK, so we do then just make sure that the scabs come off. So we nebulize them. Um, so this is just saline, but we also use um, nebulized adrenaline for any of the dogs that are having a tricky recovery. Um, and it makes a really nice um, effect on any edematous laryngeal tissue, okay? So we're using saline just to keep the noses clear, but we're also using um, a nebulized adrenaline if we've got any airway swelling. 
Now, when do we send them home? Um, we were traditionally told that you must observe them for 12 to 24 hours. I often will send sassy dogs home the same day, particularly French blue dogs. Oh, handsome. This guy had a beautiful recovery. I'm not sure that being in a hospital environment is going to do him any better than being with a sensible owner. Now, I don't send bulldogs home because bulldogs for me are a little bit unpredictable. So not the bulldogs, but the French bulldogs, I think particularly the stressy ones and the stressy pugs are often better at home. Um, we send them home on low fat food. Most of them are on paracetamol um, and they're not on opiates. And most of them are on Reprazole for five to seven days, but not if they are not regurgitations before the surgery. Now I'm gonna stop soon so you guys can ask some questions. Um, but just to say that we did show with the plasmography that our new techniques, the modified folding flap with the ALR fold resection was better than our traditional technique of staphylectomy and wedge resection. But what I can't tell you is which bit's most important because we weren't really allowed to split and do one bit at a time, okay? So I can tell you the whole new lot is better than my old lot, but I can't tell you which bits, okay? And you can see quite nice improvements in the plasmography traces after the surgery. Um, and we can measure this and we can see that many of these dogs do do quite nicely, but not all of them. OK. Um, and we've mentioned this. So prognostic factors are slim body condition. So we know that if they're fat, they often have a worse airway. So if they're thin and this have got a severe airway, then you've got a real problem. OK. Um, laryngeal collapse is a, is a negative prognostic indicator for us um, and the surgical technique. Now, I'm going to very quickly spin through this because I think we want some questions. But if that doesn't work, then we managed to sort out most of our dogs then by doing the laser turbinectomy procedure that Gerhard designed. Okay, And what we're doing here is we're taking out the ventral nasal conker um, with a rhinoscope and a diode laser. And this works quite nicely for those dogs that have got the nasal or nasopharyngeal obstruction. Um, and it's, it's actually a day case um, procedure for most of my cases now. So I split this. And I only do this if they need it, which is probably about 50 percent of my male Frenchies. And um, they'll come in for the day and go home after having done this done. So so the dogs are OK. I find it quite stressful sometimes, but the dogs are usually pretty good. Okay. And it looks like this after your surgery. And we can usually then get the dogs. So this is the dogs that have had um, traditional surgery, have come down to here and then they've gone down to here on the Boas index with the late. So we do see some nice effects with this, okay. And then this is my favorite, I think, post-operative case. <laughs> now they don't all do this, okay, but some of them do look super nice once, I, once you've operated on them. Okay, guys, I think that was plenty of lecture. Um, we're just also just going to introduce this BOA stand. So this is the one we designed with VI. Um, I think it works nicely, okay? And um, the reason we did it is because I didn't want to use those drip stands anymore. Um, and the bars that I was using are very nice, but they're also quite expensive. So this is, this is I think, a pretty useful bit of kit. Um, you can move these two bars, you can move this one in and out to fit dogs' mouths better, and this ramps up as much as you wish, okay? Now, I've also used it for stick injuries and tonsillectomy, so it does have other uses as well, but it's nice for bars. And um, I've done this because I wanted it, basically. <laughs> basically. But after that, then we have to also market it and you guys can have it too, okay? But this is so that my life is easier, okay? But hopefully it will make your lives easier as well, okay? And um, and then it looks, as you do get a nice exposure, it looks like this when you look down. Um, and then I think they've also got some um, BOAS instruments, but we're also going to design a, another kit of BOAS instruments, the ones I like, okay? Because I'm a little bit fussy about this. You may have got this impression, okay? And I think now we should take questions because that was quite a long seminar. OK, so over to you guys now. Jane, that's been um, fantastically comprehensive. Thank you um, very much for that. And we have had uh, tons of questions come in on the Q&A, so we will crack on. Um, our attendees have also been using the Q&A uh, at least half a dozen messages saying thank you so much for the webinar from people who had to leave early so lots of um, appreciation there's loads of questions I'm going to go through them one at a time this is in no particular order um, can Staffordshire Bull Terriers be considered for BOAS grading moving forward as there are some cases becoming apparent that is such a good question and some of the staffies now have got the gene disheveled too that came up in the Bulldogs okay and 
I'm a kicking myself a bit that we didn't put this on our list of bracky breeds that we're doing. So we're doing 13 bracky breeds, but that's 780 dogs I've got to look at, guys. And I'm doing dentals every week at the moment. So every Monday I dental dogs, right? So that we can get these CTs of our Pomeranians and Chihuahuas. So I should have done staffies, but we didn't. But absolutely, they they are considered as, as brackies. They do sometimes get bias. What we've done with the other breeds is we're going to design um, grading systems that are breed specific because they're so different. Like the King Charles are coming up with a nasal obstruction. Um, the Affen Pinches have got very little bit tracheal collapse. So I think with the staff is we can use a descriptive form. So we can say there is pharyngeal stertor, there is nasopharyngeal stertor, but I think we're going to have to design a brachy specific, sorry, a staffy specific grading system, because otherwise you're probably not going to be able to split the staffies as well as you should do, if that makes sense. So unfortunately, I didn't realize this when I did it, and I should have realized this, what a load of work was coming my way, but I think you have to do breed specific grading systems. Excellent. Thank you. Um... I think you've you've partially covered this. Should we do more BOAS surgeries preventatively before those dogs become symptomatic? That's a really good question. Um, the, the issue I see is that we see quite a few dogs that never get symptoms, okay? So there are quite a few grade zero dogs out there. And some of these I've followed for years. So I've seen grade zero bulldogs. In fact, a very nice breeder bought me one in that would died of an osteosarcoma, but its airway was perfect at the age of 10. So therefore we're gonna overtreat. And there's also a risk of, of BOA surgery. So my mortality rate is about 1.7 to 2%, depending on which years you look at. So we know we're going to lose some of them. And I can't always define the ones I'm going to lose because I often lose them from aspiration pneumonia. So it's often not the really bad ones that you lose. It's the one that, you know, you thought was doing really well and then suddenly aspirates. So, and also we've got back to that thing of, you know, it doesn't matter about the disease because we're just going to tweak and it's going to be fine. And also your surgery is good, but it doesn't cure, right? So we're wrong if we think the surgery is curing these because it isn't, right? So therefore, I probably wouldn't advise that we operate on unaffected dogs and we, I would wait till we get clinical signs. Thank you. Um, laryngeal collapse or paralysis, how do I diagnose conclusively that this is the primary cause of dyspnea? And how do you perform cuneiformectomy? So usually they don't get laryngeal paralysis, okay? So very few dogs I've looked at have had laryngeal paralysis. They've just got functional dynamic collapse because of those really um, excessive inspiratory pressures in the rim of glottis. Um, and we, why do we know this? We know this because one of the things we found with our late cases, which was really interesting, was that one thing that improved with the late was the laryngeal strider. So even though we hadn't touched that bit of the airway, by removing pressure in the nasal cavity, you took some of the pressure off the larynx and they improved. So you, you can diagnose the collapse by looking at the airway um, when the animal is, is anaesthetized and seeing if you've got folding of the cartilages. And then you trim the cuneiform processes by just trimming that corner off. Now in bulldogs and French bulldogs, there is a vessel that sits underneath the cuneiform process that you have to bipolar, but in most pugs you're fine. And then I put an adrenaline soaked cotton bud down the side of the ET tube for about 10 minutes just to try and stop any bleeding and stop the swelling. Um, but if you are gonna do that, just make sure that you, you are gonna keep those animals in and that you are gonna watch them quite carefully. Thank you. Um, hi, Jane. Thank you for the talk tonight. What is your opinion about correcting the everted laryngeal saccules? And what are your thoughts on using diathermy during the surgery versus scalpel? So I definitely take ventricles out if they're everted. Now, how do I judge to take them out if they are occluding the vocal folds? So when I look in, if I'm if I can't see the vocal folds because the ventricles are everted, then they come out. OK, and I use bipolar. Um, I use bipolar routinely on my palates um, and I don't tend to use it very well, uh, much else. So it's, it's really for my palates and dissecting out the palates. I am a bipolar rather than a monopolar surgeon. And interesting, there was a paper that came out recently with a very high complication rate with folding flaps. Now, that was a traditional folding flap rather than the modified. Um, but I also think there's quite a steep learning curve with the folding flap. But we haven't seen anywhere near the complication rate the Australian paper saw. But they did see more complications with monopolar than bipolar. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it. I'm not sure. I know the French group, the Fregi group, are excellent and they use monopolar routinely. So I think some of it may be experienced with the technique, but I'm a bipolar surgeon. 
Next question. Since I've been removing the internal ALAR folds and excising the ALAR wings completely, mainly French Bulldogs, the difference has been a game changer. However, I have some owners reluctant to have the wings removed completely and would prefer a standard wedge resection. Any tips on how to remove the internal folds without performing a trader because access is a tad tricky? Um, you can do it, but I'm not sure then if you're going to have a stable lateral wing, if that makes sense. I suspect those dogs might get collapse of the nostril. OK, so so I think you just got to tell your owners to go somewhere else if they don't want to do it the way you want to do it. OK, you're doing the best for the dog. And if the owners are going to be fussy, tell them, send them down the road. Right. Are there any clinical findings pre-surgery that would suggest it has nasal obstruction from stenotic nares versus stenotic nares and aberrant turbinates? That's a really good question. Um, there is a little bit of a difference in the noise, okay? So it is a bit subtle, but when it's just nostrils, it tends to be more of a strider and you can hear them sucking in. When they've got the turbinates, you tend to get more of a nasal stertor. So it's a little bit subtle, but you can, once you start to listen for it, guys, you can spot it. Thank you. I'm just, um, there's so many questions coming in. Um, why are dogs with hyperplastic tracheas getting aspiration pneumonia? Um, I think because in the young puppies, just the excessive in, uh, thoracic pressure, so they're breathing, they're having to put so much effort to suck air into that tiny trachea that then they get not just a hiatal hernia, but they're also getting reflux. OK, and if you're getting constant reflux and esophagitis, then you tend to get full reflux and aspiration. OK, so I think it's just that excessive. And interestingly, in the older studies and there's some newer actually medical studies, if you obstruct the nostrils in mice, then you cause hiatal hernias. And if you do the same thing in dogs, you can cause hiatal hernias and reflux. So so there is quite a strong link between having nasal obstruction and excessive inspiratory pressures and then refluxing. So I think that tiny trachea, the effort is so much to suck in. And we know that these guys have got bigger esophageal hiatus anyway. Uh, and I think you just get a lot of reflux in. Got a question about medications, trazodone and gabapentin. Any reduction in trazodone dose when combining with gabapentin? Not if they're vicious and young and male Frenchies, no. Would you preemptively give trazodone to be given at home before consultations in boas suspect dogs we only do it for the difficult dogs okay so this is another reason i quite like to split my consult from my theater right so if i see them in a consult list um and i know that they're difficult to handle then we absolutely give them gabapentin and, and trazodone to have a couple of hours before they come in okay but it doesn't matter so much because apart from the fact that i've had a quite an unpleasant consult they're out the door okay but we try and stop them getting wound up before they hit theater that was a good question. Can you just clarify why you give a meprazole preoperatively? Um, yeah, as an antacid, if they're frequent regurgitators, but only typically if they are regurgitating um, more than once a day. OK, so so daily regurgitators, I will give a course of a meprazole to. Um, if they are not regurgitators, I still give them a meprazole at induction because we know that when we anaesthetize these dogs, we are more likely to get reflux. So I think it makes sense to use it at induction and the IV preparation of a meprazole, they don't react to so much. Okay, So, so I think you're absolutely safe with the IV and meprazole, uh, but the oral one I use in the dogs that actually have a regurgitation issue. And what's your opinion on single dose of corticosteroids pre-op? I do it. So I use routinely use steroids at induction because I think it's the best anti-inflammatory. And I think once you get that laryngeal swelling, it really makes a difference. Now, I don't know. I've watched residents give non steroidals and have problems. But, you know, there's so few cases. I can't tell you that's really significant, but I am much happier using corticosteroids. And Otravine, adult or pediatric? Uh, we use adult and you want the drops rather than the spray, guys, because if you get the drops, you can flick the top off and then you can draw it up in a syringe. Little things that make your life easier. Okay. Um, with regards to the Boas mouth gag that we saw, uh, mm. someone's asked the question, do you ever find that some pugs teeth are too short for the stand and they slip off? Yes. And then I take the heads on. OK, so there's some pugs are just almost impossible because they have no teeth. OK, and then I've just uh, the last one that did that to me and I was so annoyed about it, but I taped it around it and it, I still found it easier than trying to put it onto onto bandage and drip stands. But yes, that's a good question. Yes. And another question about the about the stand, the tongue goes underneath the bar, underneath yes. the lap bar. 
So for me, it usually is I used to I used to tie the tongue forward separately to the jaw because I used to really crank the jaw down very hard. And then I used to pull the tongue out separately. But you can put the tongue underneath the bar, keep it forward out of the way, which is really nice. But you don't get obstruction of the tongue. So sometimes if you clamp it too hard, you get venous obstruction, but you don't get that. So, yes, I do. I bring it underneath the bar. Okay. Um, what dose of paracetamol do you use? This attendee says they found literature suggesting anything from 10 to 15 mg per kg to 30 mg per kg. Yeah, we tend to use 15 mg per kg now. So it, it has gone up and we use it three times a day quite happily. So we start off with IV at the time of surgery and then we follow that up with usually syrup or, or tablets if the dogs are difficult with the syrup. Do you recommend feeding them from a raised platform to help with regurge post-op? Um, I think for the first few times, it makes sense. I don't know if it makes any difference. I honestly don't. But I think because then at least the owners are really watching them. And I usually say feed them small meatballs because, again, it's just stopping them gulping things down. And I think if they are frequent regurges, giving them five or six meals rather than two big ones is really sensible. So so we do. Yeah, we do say yeah, feed from a height, little meatballs and just frequent feeding for the first few days and not fatty. OK, I also don't like them raw fed. I don't know if there's any evidence about this, but I just think, well, you know, you have got oral wounds. So why would you make it more likely to get infection? So we say no raw food for the first two weeks. Um, how would you deal with the breakdown of the platoplasty site? So that depends on how short it is. So we usually have to debride it. Now, we've only ever seen, to be honest, we had that really bad necrosis that I put up, right? So I did put my faults up, guys, and I didn't even do that one, but, but we had that bad necrotic one. Unfortunately, that was an RSPCA one, and we didn't have the funds, we couldn't afford um, to treat it. So that one got put to sleep, which is a real shame. I've spoken to other people, and they said they've had to debride them and resuture them, okay? So... So if you have a real necrosis, I think you do have to debride and resuture. The one with the hole in was annoying, that monopolar hole, because it was breathing beautifully, but it was gagging when it ate it, when it ate. So all we did with that was pull it forward and then resuture it. So, so it, it, the ones I've seen have not been that critical. They've had to do a huge amount of back, that makes, as in they were treatable. Mm -hmm. Someone's listening in from Malaysia at half past three in the morning. They say, thank you very much. <laughs> but I'll put that one in there. How would you thin a palate that's already had a staphylectomy? OK, this is quite tricky. So what I do with this one is I do a T-shaped incision. OK, so I go down the palate and then I go along the bottom of the edge and then I flip the edges out. So and then I put stay sutures on them. So almost like I'm opening out a T incision and then I strip out all the contents and then I suture it back. So I'm not making any shorter, but I'm taking out all the um, stromal tissue and thinning it. OK, but that's quite a little tricky one, but I enjoy it. But it's a tricky one. I've also done it with a U-shaped incision where I did an inverted U, flipped the oral mucosa back and then took out the content. So it, it doesn't matter how you do it, really. I've, I've tried a few different ways. I quite enjoy this kind of thing. Um, but you just want to keep your oral mucosa and, and either move it to one side or flip it down and then strip out all the thickness. It's definitely doable. Mm -hmm. I hope everyone's OK for time because the answers, the questions just keep on coming in. Jane, are you OK to stay online? Yeah, maybe for another five, 10 minutes, and then I'm going to go and have dinner, if that's all right. Perfect. Yeah. What do you think about just doing a more aggressive traditional SP resection to level of mid tonsil as an option? Um, it depends on the breed, I think. So so I think most pugs don't have the thickest palate in the world. So I think you're absolutely fine with that. Some of the French Bulldogs and the Bulldogs, um, I've had to come back and thin palates um, when they've had particularly vessel sealers, guys. So I, I don't use vessel sealers and I might just be a little bit biased because I've had to reoperate on quite a few. Um, but the vessel sealers seem to give you a little bit more of a thickness of the palate. And those guys are the ones where I've had to come back and, and thin them um, because they've typically had sleep disordered breathing. OK, so so it does seem that if you have a real chunk of soft tissue that it can cause an issue. And some of those dogs, the soft tissue is so thick in the palate. So you're often looking at a palate that's like two centimetres thick and, and it can cause issues. So so in many dogs, I think that'll be absolutely fine. But you're going to get the occasional French bulldog or bulldog with a really thickened palate that you may then struggle with. Laser turbinectomy, how often do you have to re-perform it? Really rarely. OK, so. So we occasionally see dogs that about 18 months to two years later start to get some um, recurrence of the clinical signs and then we go back and we trim it. And when you trim it again, it's much easier because the regrowth is, is often less. Um, but I've, I've been recently seeing some dogs that we operated on four or five years ago and they're still quite clear. So, 
So it's meant to be about 10%, but I don't think we are doing that many. Okay. Um, maxillary nerve block, unilateral or bilateral? Bilateral. Yeah. Otravine, can it be useful in the emergency stabilization of some BOAS or hypothermia cases? Absolutely. Um, so it's a really nice thing to do. And the other thing I sometimes use it for is if the owners think, or you think the dog's got nasal obstruction and you're trying to work out where your lesion site is, if you ask the owners to put it in at night, um, just to see what difference it makes, then you can evaluate how they respond to that and think about whether they're going to benefit from a turbinectomy or not. But it's really bitter. So most people will only get it in once because I don't know if you guys have tried it. I use it when I get a cold. It's not nice. OK, so so some people say, well, why can't I just use this? Well, A, because you're meant to get a rebound effect in three or four weeks if you use it for too long. And B, because you're going to probably fail to have a good relationship with your animal when you use it every night. How short is too short for staphylectomy? That's a really good question. I don't know if I know the answer. Um, I'm not sure with French bulldogs and bulldogs, it matters too much because you've got such a big tongue that when they swallow, they pretend and they, and they move the larynx back, the tongue base comes up and protects the larynx. I've had two pugs in 10 years, to be fair, maybe 20 now. I've had two pugs that have gagged a little bit after drinking water. OK, so no problems with eating food, but they've definitely gagged a little bit after drinking water. And I thought, OK, I've gone short enough. So I'm, I'm not as radical with pugs as I am with French bulldogs and bulldogs. Any merit to doing vocal cordectomy in severely affected BOAS dogs? No. And um, I think if you do, you're more likely to get laryngeal webbing, which is really unusual for us to see. OK, so I don't think doing vocal cordectomy is going to make a huge amount of difference because it, it tends to collapse a little bit further up. So when you get really bad collapse, it's the cuneiforms and the cuniculates that tend to go. I personally wouldn't go after the, the vocal folds. Okay. Do you have any tips for nasal valve surgery in Persian cats? Yeah, just do the nostrils, right? And I've tried a few different techniques. There's quite a nice one about to be published where they took out some cartilage above the wing. I thought was nice. I'm going to try that next. But I take that the ALA fold and I do the traders like I do the beaver blade, as well, but I use a beaver blade. OK, so I use a tiny little blade and I do my normal technique and I've done pretty well so far. And um, but the look for the new technique that's coming out where they actually went full thickness with the cartilage and use that just to hoik back the nasal plane because I thought that was really clever. Okay. And I reviewed it and it was nice. Right. Um, do you use the brisk score? I find it confusing. Somebody comments. No. <laughs> um, I don't use it, but I have it at the back of my mind that if the animals come in as an emergency or if that if it's hypothermic, then I need to be careful if that makes sense. So no, I don't use it. I use my own grading scheme. Huh? But I do have it at the back of my mind that, OK, this one's our previous surgery. It's an emergency. And, and you know, it does. You kind of know the risk factors. It makes sense apart from the temperature, which I do. I do note that. Good. There are literally we could with the number of questions we've had, Jane, we could probably stay online for another hour. Mm -hmm. um, we are 10 minutes over time. So I think another one or two and then we stop. Is that OK with you? Yeah, it's so nice to have such an engaged audience, guys. So thank you. Yeah, honestly, to everyone in our audience, this we, we've had not only record numbers um, of you guys online tonight, but also uh, seriously record numbers of Q&A. This is amazing. Um, how I can pick off a few here that I can see that are really easy. So yeah, how go. Yeah. the last grading assessor email the Kennel Club, right? I teach twice a year. And we do um, functional grading sessions where we basically just look at a load of dogs, OK? Um, and that's really helpful. Thank you. The nasal chart and the pug body condition score, if you look at Cambridge BOAS, those are all on that site, OK? So they are free to use. Please help yourself, OK? There you go. That was two gone, right? Or three gone? Yeah. Super. Um, how do you feel that BOAS affects the dog's ability to sniff and scent in comparison to a healthy dog? Asking from a behavioural point of view and how important scent is to dogs. That's a really good question. There was a study that looked at pugs versus German shepherds, and I think they expected to find German shepherds a huge amount better than pugs, and they didn't. The pugs were actually pretty damn good at scenting, which I thought was very interesting. But one thing that I do notice is that when you have done the nostril surgery, the dogs sniff a huge amount more and the owners will comment on this, okay? So they must have better scenting or they must get increased scent after you've done the nostril surgery. But interestingly, they do seem to have decent scent um, ability even before the surgery um, in some of these brachy dogs. Surprising. 
Is it possible to cut out too much of the soft palate? Um, we've kind of covered that one. I don't think in French Bulldogs or Bulldogs it is, but in Pugs it, it probably is, yes. And Pugs, I'm, I, I tend to go mid tonson in Pug. Okay. There's um, just so many questions, Jane. Yeah. I don't know if you want to do a quick scan through and see. Um, some of them I can pick off. So how do you remove the tonsils? Do I use diathermy? Yes, I do. Okay. And it's, I think it's easier. So I use bipolar. You could use monopolar. You can do it without with a, with a suture, but it's not quite so easy. Okay. The lateral alar fold wedge technique, um, it was in one of our papers, but we weren't really allowed to describe it particularly well. Um, but the resident that wrote up the wedge, he did a load of models of silicon noses and he did the wedge versus the alar fold and he will publish this year and he will definitely have a really good description in there. Why don't I give them opiates? Because I think it makes them feel a little bit nauseous. Okay, so I don't want these guys to regurgitate. So I only give them um, additional opiates if I think they're painful, and it's really unusual for us to think they're painful if we give them the um, if we give them the uh, the block. Uh, do we use transdynamic acid to improve bleeding control in the post-op period? No, because I don't usually see a big issue with bleeding. Um, USA, great. Um, I think it, I don't think it's wrong to keep them in overnight hospitalized, but but we don't if they're stressy now and the owners are sensible, we tend to send them home, but not the bulldogs. OK. Um, thanks, guys. So many messages of thanks on here. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, we're, we're doing all right, aren't we? Um, laser surgery. I only tend to laser the the palate, so I don't know about the palate, but I think there's some nice studies that show carbon dioxide um, laser is a nice technique for the palate. Okay. Am I routinely nebulizing my case with adrenaline and recovery? Only typically if I think they are a little bit rocky. So if I've done any laryngeal surgery, so say I've done the chenophorectomies, I tend to, and I tend to do it if they were really severely affected. So the grade threes, um, I tend to as well, but routine grade twos, no. Okay. There's one here about antibiotics, Jane. Do you send them home with antibiotics and do you use IV antibiotics during surgery? So that's a really interesting question. I'm slightly sore about that because I had a dog die of sepsis about three weeks ago. Oh. Um, and I don't use perioperative antibiotics and I don't send them home with postoperative antibiotics. And I spoke, my brother's an anaesthetist. So I spoke to my brother about this and he said, well, you're being silly. You can't react to one case. He's very blunt, my brother. Um, but we looked up the human and they never give tonsillectomies in children antibiotics. So they're not giving them postoperative or perioperative. Now dogs are not children, but maybe that's probably the best evidence we've got at the moment. Um, so I don't, I've had one dog die of sepsis. His comment was that you would have, you know, you probably would have had that anyway. The problem with sepsis is it's not your typical post-operative complication. So the owners don't react because the dog's breathing is fine, if that makes sense, but it just goes off its food. So it's a tricky one, um, but I routinely don't. And I've, I don't know how many I've operated on now, but I'm probably a thousand, probably I would have thought. And that's the first one I saw with any infection. So I don't, but I don't know if I'm right. Um, but I also think maybe you don't react to the case that goes wrong. So it's a tricky one, guys. I don't know. I'm feeling a bit sore about that at the moment. I hate losing cases. I didn't see that one coming. But most of my dogs seem absolutely fine with no antibiotics. I don't do clotting profiles before the surgery, uh, but I do check that they've been um, covered for lungworm. OK, so I'm super careful about um, lungworm now and angus So I do make sure that they they are covered. And if they're not, then I will do clotting profiles. That was a really good question from Rafael. OK. OK. I'm absolutely blown away by the number of questions we've got. We, I don't think we're going to get to them all, Jane. And guys, they are really good questions and I would love to answer them all, but I'm also hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, I think I think we should call it a night. This has been an absolutely fantastic webinar, biggest audience yet. So thank you so much to everyone who's attended live this evening. Um, I will be sending out CPD certificates. You will all get a link um, to watch a recording of the webinar because I'm aware that there was masses of information in there. Um, those of you who are still online, if I can ask just for another couple of minutes of your time, when I end the webinar, there will be a post webinar survey that pops up on your screen. If you could just take a couple of minutes um, to give us some feedback about what you've seen tonight, that would be really, really appreciated. Um, so Jane, it's time for you to go and um, eat your supper. I hope you've got something delicious planned. And uh, thank you so much for your time in preparing and delivering this webinar. It's been uh, so good and the number of messages that we've had on the Q&A saying thank you I think the audience feels the same
Well, I just like to say to the audience, A, I'm sorry I went on for so long and there was lots I wanted to say and I didn't have time. So I also got a bit fast at the end. So I do apologise. But you've been a lovely audience. So thank you so much for your participation because it's been great. So thank you. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. OK, but... thank you very much, Jane. And thank you to our audience. We will be running more webinars um, every two months. So keep an eye on social media for those. And I'll say good night. Thanks again, Jane. Thank Bye. You. Bye.